best, uh, well, your best moments on, on the snooker table. Uh, this is one of your best moments, uh, your best matches as well. And it lasted just under an hour. Of course, it was at the Masters this year, earlier on 2014. A game that Ricky Walden will want to forget. Where do you rank this match amongst your all-time performances? Because it was uh, faultless from your point of view. Yeah, I mean, definitely as far as sort of um, break building, dominance and just, you know, just pure accuracy, really. I was probably the best match I've ever played. Um, but it was just one of them days where everything I just hit was just bang in the middle of the hole. Great pop from O'Sullivan. One. A lot of amateurs playing the game, mm. they often practice with maybe three, four, five reds yeah. left because that's where you mm. quite often win a frame of snooker. Mm. You get to the table, you're sort of 30 or 40 behind, there's yeah. three or four reds left. Do you practice a setup like this a lot? Do you put maybe a cluster of balls around the black spot and then try and dish up? Yeah, a lot of my stuff is, is kind of based around, you know, break building and trying to win the frame in, in, in one visit if you can. But a lot of this stuff is just stuff that you've been doing over the years and it's just how you picture the table and, and you see it. And, and even in this break so far, you know, I've played two or three lose positional shots so you know my positional play wasn't great but you know as long as you're concentrating well and you're focusing on one ball at a time then you're, you're able to recover it sometimes and that's what I've done the rocket has liftoff terrific clearance of 79 from Ronnie O'Sullivan to take the opening frame that's a horrible situation to be in Ricky Warden yeah, he's, he's, he's in a lot vile, of trouble there because... How are you going to get out if this is your shot? What are you doing to you get can, out? You can only contain here, and this is where you want your opponent, really, whereas they can't attack you. Is you he know? trying to drop on that ball on the cushion? Yeah, I think he's only opportunity in there to try and contain me. But once you've got him in this position, so you kinda, not... you're dictating the play. Um, but, you know, there's not a lot on here that I can really do. You know, I want to try and get my white in this area because then I know that this, this side's blocked off but I don't want to leave him a shot where he can put me in trouble. So even though I've got the upper hand here, you're always aware that you don't want to give the upper, the upper hand back to your opponent. So, so that, that's what you're trying to do? You're trying to get the white behind, like, the blue and the yellow? Yeah, I don't just want to stick the white up here and sit back in my chair and then come back and think, well, I haven't put him in trouble, you know. Um, OK, but so it's not just about getting it safe, it's getting him in trouble as well? Yeah, it's about getting the right line, getting in trouble. So I don't really want him to be able to... Uh, to flick it that side of the table See so he here, can come back playing here, he, he hasn't got great control over the cue ball, whereas if the white was there, he can hit this one a lot harder, swing it around there and put me in trouble. So by doing that, he's, he, all he's been able to do is play that shot. He hasn't been able to put any work into the white okay. because he would have gone too, off. Basically, he's just surviving. It's too risky, though. yeah, he's kind of playing content. Where me now, I can swing this around put a lot of power into the shot, go for the pot, I've put side Did you go for it. that? Was it a shot to nothing? I sort Did of you... went for it, but again, look, I haven't got a great length, but as long as I've got a good line, you know, I'm thinking, if that stops there, he snookered, but he isn't. But this isn't an easy shot. So I'm always thinking that, you know, even though I'm leaving him that, it's still not an easy shot. In, in a situation like that, because he's playing it, he's playing it full ball, or sort of half ball, but yeah. direct, is it not better to come off the cushion? Because you've got the worry he's playing it too thick, which is, of course, exactly what he's done. Should yeah. he not have come off the cushion and just Yeah, but if he does the... that, then I'm just going to then clip off that red and put him in trouble. Ricky's now trying to obviously get, get the upper hand and gain control. He's been on the back foot for maybe four or five safeties. And, and if you if you're pl keep playing shots and you're on the back foot, you start to then think, oh, I'm not getting in the game. I'm being bullied. I'm being bossed around. Yeah. So that's, that's the idea of really trying to make every safety shot count and when you've got the upper hand, keeping the upper hand and now I've got half a chance. Now, now the pressure's on me now because I've had him in trouble for four or five shots. Are you, but, are, you looking at, are you looking not just at the pot but a route back to well, ball? Well, basically, I'm only going to go for a red if I can get onto a colour. There's no point me potting this red and not getting on a colour because there's, there's too much at stake, there's too much risky. See, there? see if I'd have missed that, I've left him in, he's got control. I didn't aim on hitting So where were you trying to get I the white? I tried to get in here. OK, and then come round for the, for the pink? For the pink, and then I think I can win the game. So, although I've potted one, it was, you know, it's not really, I've not really done anything. So now it's about just getting good, good safety again, keeping the pressure on. You know, you can only really play something off of this red. Up and down. I've got a good white, so we can't dig into the white and get any spin on the white. Do you so, enjoy the safety battles like this? I do now, yeah. I mean, I... I you used to I, hate them. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I was always more an aggressive attacking player, but since working with Ray Reid and I've kind of realised that 
safety is a, a, a massive part of the game. And if you want to compete in a modern world, you've got to be able to play the safety, the break building. Mm. And, you know, the, these, these top players are so good that you have to have the all-round game. So he's, he's left you a sort of half chance here. Yeah, this one here. But again, is it important that you've got that route back to, yeah. to the ball cushion? I mean, yeah, I mean, I've, I mean, I've played a bad shot. So I've played two bad shots, all that, and, and, and it was only because I potted them that I got away with it. If yeah. I missed that, he's banging the in. balls. I didn't mean to hit the black. But because I did, I've kind of kept up here. So there's a bit of luck involved, but you still got to get the pot. So you're trying to swing round the black? Yeah, I wanted to miss the black. There was no way I was aiming to hit that. I was going to come up round here, maybe for brown or, or the yellow. But as it turned out... And, it, and it's at moments like this that you start to think, OK, I've played good safety, I've been patient, I'm not feeling great, I'm, I'm, I'm nervous. He's a good-looking lad, that fellow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm nervous and I've kind of, um, you know, and I've, and I've been patient and now I've got my rewards. So now it's just a matter of concentration, and now the balls are perfect, really. I mean, if you look at these six reds, there's, there's a 50-60 break on. So that, all I'm thinking is try and make 50-60 here. Just try and keep it nice, neat, compact. Is that tidy. honestly all you're thinking? Just make the, the frame when you break the 60? You're not thinking of a ton? Nah, nah. I mean, not at all. So no. you're thinking, I'm not I mean, going to touch these, offer, I'm not going to touch those. Yeah, if you offered me 65-70 now, I'd go, yeah, of course, yeah. happy days, I'll take that. When you get to that 68 head, 67 on the table... Yeah, you, you start to relax. D does it? Does it make yeah. that much of a difference? Now I'm thinking 100. Now I'm thinking, OK, I've won the frame. I'm, 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 in, I'm in the driving seat. I just want to continue now, you know, potting balls, keeping them off the table. Let me ask you... you know, uh, trying uh, to find that sweet spot. At the beginning of your career, mm. when you used to get to the latter stages of the frame and you knew it was in the bag, very similar 70. to this, yeah. you would start playing a lot of exhibition shots, a bit like Jimmy White used to do. Yeah. And then you stopped doing that. It's like, back in the day, you would have slammed that in. Really. Yeah, I just think sometimes you just become a bit more professional about how you think, the way you perform, the way you approach the game. So, whereas right before, I used to play in a lot of anger and a lot of frustration. Yeah. You know, people go, oh, yeah, did you see Ronnie play, Potter Dizzy play and that? But really, I was just so frustrated and angry with how I was playing, I'd just end up just wanting to smash balls everywhere. <laughs> whereas now, I'm actually feeling much more disciplined in the way I approach the game. I'm now wanting to finish the game, play the right shot, and it's just a state of mind, really. So, you know, I mean, I've got to a great start. It's 2-0, and, um, yeah, I'm thinking, you know, this is, this is, this is where I want to be. You've been in that situation where you've been sat in your seat for a yeah, long time. Yeah, How difficult horrendous. It? It's the worst feeling in the world. You just feel like, you feel like an idiot sitting there. You feel like, oh, what am I doing here? You know, I'm just... I have to talk about this shot because swerving around the yeah, brown and yeah. putting the long red. There was an element of, like, that was, like, a one in maybe a hundred shot. But when you're hitting the ball well, if you notice there, the white swerved a bit. But what are you playing? But you're playing just to get a real good, solid contact on the white, get a nice throw. And if you get a nice throw, yeah. the idea was just to get the white down to here. OK. And as long as I get that right, I'm not bothered if the white goes in, because okay. I was in trouble, really. I didn't have a shot on. After I played the first red, a lot of players would have just played safe. Because, but because you're 3-0 up and you're flying. Well, I'm, no, I'm just thinking, this is, you've, you're in, you, this is a chance. You've got to make the most of your chances, whereas a lot of players think it's a bit risky, play safe. And I think that's the difference between me, Higgins and Hendry. Even though they look a bit risky, we, we do realise that it's a chance and you've got to make your chance. And by going for that, even if you miss it, you're still sending a message out that I ain't backing down. You're going to get that for the whole match. Uh, so you're, you're applying pressure all the time. But a lot of players might not play that attacking shot. Yeah, but because in the back of their mind, they think, I can't really clear up from here. Yeah, not but, clear up, but you know, you know that you've got yeah, the that's, talent. That's putting limitations on your mind, on yeah, your game. Of and you're, you're settling for second best. Yeah. You're, you're saying, basically, I'm hoping you make a mistake so I can win. Yes. And I, and I know that you're never going to be successful if you play with that attitude. The only way to be successful in a serial winner like Hendry and Higgins was is to take the game by the scruff of yeah. the neck, make it happen. But a lot of players don't have that. Well, they, they, I think they accept that they're not prepared to change their game, to train their technique, to change their outlook upon playing. Um, I don't accept that people can't play like that. I just think people are not prepared to take the risk, to, to take their game apart and try and take their game to the next level. So only two... Loose reds now, so of course yeah. you've got to split the pack open. Yeah. And again, it's just about getting a solid contact, 
I only want one shot. I'm not looking to get on two or three reds. You know, ideally that'd be great, but it wasn't a great pack to go in, so, you know... Did I, you hit the right red in the right place? Yeah, I mean, I, I sort of could have hit it half ball, got a bit of an arc and left my white up here. But then you've really got to be queuing well to control the spin, because otherwise you could have missed the pack and left myself nothing. Right. So I'm thinking... So, just talk me through this shot, because it's... It, I mean, it, it's an incredible shot and it just about drops in. Yeah, I mean, it can go wrong because you're so close, but it was just... It was a straight shot, so I just had to make sure I didn't double hit it. So even though it looked like quite a good shot, it wasn't as good as, say, where I potted the black from there, you know? It was... OK. Do you like the little tippy-tappy shots, like this pink as well, a little...? No. You don't I, like them? I don't, I don't like, I don't like tippy-tappy shots. I'd rather hit a ball firm so as it holds its line more, you know, and you've got more solid, solid shot, you know? When you start sort of trying to tippy-tappy and you start to then get a bit hesitant in your technique and then you start to lose the white a little bit and then your positional play suffers a bit and so I'd rather hit firm shots. Look at that. Look at that. The crowd love it. Well, that's incredible. Just brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Were you surprised Ricky came out after the interval? Nah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Falling up, I mean, it's such a lovely position to be in, isn't it? Now, uh, things like that happen, now you know it's your day. You know, I've played all them frames, I'm thinking whatever, but then I played a really bad break, uh, and he should be in by rights. And I've missed the blue. Look, I meant to come in here. I've gone round there. That's how far out right I was. I hit the knuckle, and it's turned out I've got him banging trouble. And that's ridiculous. I that mean, that, that, I should be fined for that. <laughs> I should get a disciplinary letter in the post for that. You know what I mean? For being too Free lucky. The game is <laughs> yeah, it's ridiculous. I mean, now I'm embarrassed because I'm thinking I'm four 0 up. Ricky's a nice guy, and, and I've just I've played a terrible shot, and I'm banging trouble, and I'm thinking it's 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 a liberty, really. You know, if that was happened to me, I'd be like. <sighs> You know what I mean? I'd be cursed. <laughs> I think deep I down would. he probably was. Yeah, and, uh, you know, but that's, that's why I always say snooker is a nasty sport. <laughs> it's kind of... Let's see it's so harsh. You know, and he played a decent shot there, but now I'm falling out, I've got a bit of luck, now I'm thinking, right, I just... I'm, I, everything's in my favour. Like you said, is there a point where you think, oh, everything I do today, I'm just going to breathe? Now nah, this is the part of the game where I think, hold on, it is my day. So that's a, that's a typical example about the line. You see Ricky there, he's hit the yellow. Yeah. That's, I mean, he's responsible if, for If that. I was Ricky's coach, yeah. I would say, look, that's a fatal error. We are now going to get back on the practice table and, and part of your punishment and part of you becoming a better player mm. is that we're going to give 15 minutes a day, that's all, 15 minutes, and you're just going to play these shots. You're just going to be playing these shots and it's going to be like a warm-up for you. So you go to the gym, you do a bit of stretching, yeah. that's a warm-up for you. You ain't got to play them perfect. you just got to play 15 minutes a day four or five times a week. If you times that by a week, times that by a month, that's six hours that you've allocated to that. Huge difference and then to when you get in a match, you're going to play that shot and you're going to get it right maybe half the time instead of none of the time. Yeah. You know, by that one shot, he's lost control of the table. And that's being harsh, but, you know, we're, in, we're talking about top-level sport yeah. here, so you, you're going to have to be harsh. This was a good shot. When I'm hitting these balls well, look, boom, one, two, three, I've got four reds. But it's, I'm not, my white's not here, my white's nowhere near that red. I'm playing for an area, and now I'm sort of, this is where it's, the game's becoming easy now. You know, I'm starting to feel really confident, really happy, hitting the ball well. I'm in control. Look, I've even, like, boshed it off the cushion. My, my, some players might just play for, for the, the red in the middle. middle. But I just thought, no, I'm really hitting it well. I want to really punch this one in. Yeah, he wanted another century, didn't he? But 77 will do. The onslaught continues. So when he's breaking off for, for frame six, yeah, are you thinking I really want to whitewash, or are you thinking get out as quick as you can, or just it's all about? No, I've learned so much from working with uh, Steve 
Peters, you know, there'd be a lot of times where I'd be like, oh, I'm 3 0 up, 4 0 up, don't make a mistake, you know, you've got control. And I just think, no, nah, I just want to play each ball, each frame. In, in fact, I don't want it to end. The right. attitude I have, yeah. that I want to have, is that I don't want it to end. I don't want this to end. It's, it's what, you know, you want to enjoy the process. You, you so wouldn't have said that three or four years ago. Yeah, no, exactly, yeah. That's a great shot. That's what we were talking about earlier about your long game. Yeah, I the mean. The little flick off the black. Yeah, and I, and I mean, I've played for the black, which is. But not the flick. Not the flick, no. no. But, but it sort I've, of helped. I've I mean, that could have gone wrong dramatically. Yeah. I mean, so, I'm, I'm, you know, to play shots like that, I mean, you, you have to be, like, really seeing it well and confident. You're thinking maximum now, aren't you? No. Come on. No, I ain't. You are. Look, I'm even not. your little grin now tells me you no, are. No, I really ain't. I'm definitely not thinking maximum. Everyone else in there is, you know that. If I'd have been playing great positional play all through the, 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 the match, you know, and getting on the black, you know, as I've explained to you before, I've been, had to go up to the blue a lot, I've had to play a lot of bulk colours, so I'm not really playing these shots fantastic, but, you know, I'm just thinking, OK, I'm not playing them fantastic, but, you know, I'll just do what I can, just keep control as much as I can, just keep potting balls, you know, and just, if you can stay around the black, great, if not, you're playing up for the blue pretty well, you know, and, and just trying to just play the right shot. But if I'm on it and I'm hitting every ball at the sweet spot, then I'm thinking a one four seven is possible. But that was the only thing missing from this performance. You know, that shot was a good shot, because a lot of the time you can hit it wrong and not get up there, but when you start playing them shots good, it's nice, because you, you kind of, look, you know, played it really well. Well, those those shots, right. I mean, you've not so played that, 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 that one at all. That was awful. But why is that? Because the distance between the white and the red? Well, because, like I said to you before, you know... It, when but I, it, when but I... it might have turned out right, because you've got an angle on the black tone yeah, of the red. No, but it's still, not, it's still not good, you know what I mean? It's, what I'm saying is, is, like, at the start of the match, I said I wasn't feeling great, and them shots, them shots are in your locker. But I've focused so well that I've just... I've not allowed it to affect me. But it's the minute you lose your concentration, then you can throw a really bad one in. But when you're curing really well, mm. your bad ones are not so bad. <sighs> you know, maybe I was thinking of a match. Sure. Yeah, I was, yeah. But again, I think I got away with it, you know. Yeah. Well, I left them in red in the middle. And I was a bit disappointed, you can see, by the expression on my face. Do you still get nervous on a maximum? Yeah, yeah, you still in get practice? nervous. I don't really go for them in practice, really. You don't? Yeah, no, nah, so... But in the matches, yeah, you, you kind of... You can't help but get nervous, you know, cos it's oh, sort of... You feel for him there, don't you? He got away with that, though, look. Yeah, he won't be thinking no, he got away I'm with that. I'm joking, I'm being... No, no, <laughs> that's, that's me being silly. Do you think he wants to just get out of there as quickly as possible? Um, probably. Probably, yeah. But again, you know, years ago, I might have tried to pop that, yeah. get on the pink, panicked. I should have won the frame in one visit and I haven't. Or oh, next chance I get, I'm going to try and make it happen. But I thought, you know what? Nah, the right shot is the snooker. Enjoy the process. Play the right shot. You're out here. You know, this is what you practice years and years for. Why, why rush and getting out? Good shot. You don't really want to leave a touching well, it's ball. A, it's a, no, it's a containing shot. And it's, it's, it's easy for me to just drop that down onto the bolt cushion. And, uh, in, fact, in fact, you would think effectively ends the frame because if it is a touching ball, which it was, yeah, I mean, he's in trouble. Yeah, I've put him in trouble there. He's not really got a lot on there. But again, you know, this is it where you kind of want to get that line or you want to hit it thicker and get that line and come in behind is, the other. Is he playing for the first red or the second red? Um, he played for that. That's okay. the red I would have played for. And there you see, he's got a good, he's got a decent line. But just a bit short. Well, yeah, but you don't mind. You get a good line. Okay. You can you can suffer being a few bits off the off the uh, off the cushion because there's not a lot I can do. All I can do is try and play another good safety shot. But here I'm going to try and maybe swing it round because I like playing that shot. You got more control over the white. The, 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 the more power you can probably put into the ball, the more control you got over it. So I always like to play that shot where you swing That's it That's a difficult shot. As, an, as a, a, a keen player of the game, I find that one of the most difficult shots. Yeah, because you've got to judge the, the, the side that you put on the wire. Yeah. You're, swer you're basically you're swerving the ball. That's right. And, but you've got to kind of get the right contact on the object ball as well. And again, like I said, you know, like, he's, he's, he's totally hit that wrong. He's got away with it, but he's hit it thin. He's got a bad line. If that was a safety shot, it'd have been up and down. Yeah. So that's why I'd say, you know, it's important to try and practice them shots because they come up quite a lot. They're like shots and nothings. There's the safety shot. You play that shot quite a lot and if you get your head around maybe understanding why you hit one good, why you hit one bad 
I mean, that's, that's, that's a good such line. a good shot. It's a good line. It was a good weight. I got, and then you end up getting a little flick off a ball and it goes yeah. on the cushion. So it's, it, there's an element of luck there, but there's an element of, like, you know that once you get that bit right, even if you go close to it, you're not going to get a full ball contact. So you didn't put enough side on that at all? I mean, that, no. That's quite... We didn't hit it hard enough. For the side to take? Yeah, we just didn't hit it hard enough. Yeah. It was a bit weak, it was a bit... The side, you didn't hit a solid contact on the white, so by the time it hit the cushion, the side was gone. Yeah. But if you hit it a bit firmer, the side would have held on. By the time we got to the cushion, the side was off. And why has he done that? Because... Because he hasn't, he hasn't been just... firm enough of it. That's why when you look at John Higgins, he would always be firm with that, and he would have got the side, and it would have come down there, and you'd have been in trouble. But that ain't easy. No. I mean, that takes accuracy, technique... And it's more difficult ability. when you five mil down. Do you know what I mean? That's, that's a really hard shot we're talking about there. It's not an easy shot, especially under the pressure. So I'm not being critical, I'm just highlighting the little subtleties of a John Higgins, why John yeah. Higgins is so good, why Steve Hendry, why Steve Davis was so good, because they played them shots nine times out of ten, and Selby, he played that shot. You know, he'd never make that mistake. Mm. You know, back in now, of course, the frame and the match is done and dusted. Mm. It's a nice position to be in, isn't it? Yeah, no. Home crowd, 6-0. Yeah, yeah, I love this tournament, you know, because it's just down the road and it's like top 16 players in the world. It is really like... Um, like the Masters at golf, I suppose. It's just such a such a great event to play in. So to kind of start hitting a bit of form at this stage of the tournament was good, you know. And, Can and you it... carry form through? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Can when, you? Well, yeah, when you start playing like this and, you, you you know, you're consistently strong and solid, that's what I'm saying. I knew I wasn't going to be able to perform like this in my next match because, you you know, you have look... These are just, like, rare moments. But for me, it was just about knowing that, you know, I was I was going to be strong in, in all departments, you know. I wasn't going to... My, my levels... So if you got a level from 1 to 10, that was 10. I knew I wasn't going to drop below 7. So And even 7 was 32. still going to be, you know, good enough to win the tournament, good enough to play. It's when you start dropping down to, like, 4s and 3s, you think, hold on, mate, I'm going to get found out here today <laughs> or in this tournament. What do you say? You were lucky in the second. <laughs> yeah. That's a nice no, feeling, pleasing, isn't it, coming it's Yeah, it's really pleasing to have, um, you know, and I know it wasn't exciting in, in terms of, you know, it was tense and down to a final frame, but it, it was good in the way that, you know, the standard was great, I played mm. some good stuff. And Where do you rate that match? Um, that's got to be, you know, it's got to be one of my best matches, you know, I've played, I've played a lot of good matches. I think, I, I think the best, one of the best matches I played was against Hawkins in the final World Championships. I really thought I was scoring well. Potting well, my safety was good, and especially having a, having a year out, it really kind of like was like a special moment for me. But this was more kind of um, you know, I was in the groove. I've been playing a few tournaments up until this, so to put in performances like this when you put the hard work in and you've, you know, you've maybe not won as many tournaments, you know, you've lost in the quarters or you've lost a few matches, but you feel like your game is there. So then when come to a major tournament and it really just all hits form, you just think, well, all that hard work is and all the little sacrifices you make for it to come right in a, in mm. a tournament like this, that's what you, you pray for and you hope for, you know, and it doesn't always happen, but when it does, you just have to go, you know what, you know, I'm, I'm lucky in some ways to have experienced that, you know. Stay tuned as after the break, it's Ronnie's best interviews from the first series. Hey, you're good at this. <laughs> Throughout the first series of The Ronnie O'Sullivan Show, the five-time world champion has interviewed some of the game's biggest stars. Here's a selection of the best bits, which we just didn't have time to show you first time around. For you, what was it like getting into snooker, and, and what was your first memories of, like, starting playing snooker, really? Um, the, the game back that far, going back into the 70s, was very much the story of two different strands the the working men's club, the social clubs, where people were playing as a pastime, very much on the side of having a beer. Mm. And then the snooker clubs, the, the billiard halls, that were temperance, no drink. Snooker people went along there to play just snooker. And those two strands were running sort of concurrently. And at some stage along the, the line, the popularity of the game was bubbling under. And TV came along at just the right moment to tap into that enthusiasm. And before we knew it, not only did we have Pop Black, which was the, the granddaddy of all the TV programmes, 
But the next phase of that was the Wimbledon Style World Championship, which was well known to the masses the year that Terry Griffiths won it in 79. And I was very fortunate that I'd turned professional 78 and was starting to make a name for myself, but didn't really know what was ahead because we didn't know what was ahead for the game. And before I knew it, I was in the space of two years from being a young up and coming player turning professional. Two years later, I was a household name on British television. It's quite an astonishing transformation and the rest of the 80s was like that. At one stage we seemed to be on, let's say we, uh, the, the top players, um, seemed to be on every television programme going, in, invited onto any type of programme. Some of the things we got invited onto were big sort of TV news, you know, Morecambe and Wise show, the comedy show was massive in the UK. You get invited onto it. It's the thing like you... Spitting image. I remember that. Yeah. Um, Cannon and Ball, which were a big name at the time, but like you know, kids' programmes like Blue Peter and Tiz was that were, you know, they they only got people that people knew on, so therefore the game must have been popular, and we felt like pop stars, and I would say the modern day player, apart from yourself, the modern day player is not treated like that. You're still treated like that. So you'll know to some degree the excitement that, that surrounds you. There's a little bit of a, a fervour around things. Mm. But that was what it was like back in the 80s. Mm. We, we were mobbed. But I've watched how you've played certain players. I mean, John Higgins, for me, is one of the greatest players that's ever played. And he kind of has the voodoo on pretty much everyone he plays. But I remember when once you came on the circuit, you kind of stopped him in his tracks. And you'd be playing well, and you'd be going bang, bang, bang. And you could just see that, hold on, you, could, you kind of gave everyone a bit of hope that... <laughs> no, really, I mean, because he could have run away with it. He's, he was that good of a player. But for someone like you to come along, you kind of pulled him back towards the pack and I don't know whether you realise that but that's what I that's what I see that happen. What I want to know is is that did you have a game plan or a strategy to, to cope with someone like Higgins? When you're playing like a, a, a middle ranked sort of player, somewhere around sort of mm. twenty or thirty in the world, there's, there's it's not so much of a you kinda know if you play well you kinda win. Mm. With John Higgins you you can play well and you, you can play really well and you can still still get beat. I mean I beat him um, in the semi-finals of the Grand Prix in uh, 2009. I beat him 6-5 on the black. I had, I had three total clearances <laughs> yeah, to go 5-3 up. I remember that match. And he just, he, he, he wouldn't go away. You know, he just kept, <laughs> and he's got back to five each. I'm, you know, ended up winning 6-5 on the black, but I, you know, after that match, I sort of thought, how, how could I ever even come close to losing that with how well I've played? And um, I think that, you know, Playing the likes of yourself, you know, John Higgins, Stephen Hendry, you, you, you ha there needs to be. You've got to be able to do something special. You know, you need to. You need to do more than just sort of go out and just play. You know, and, and see what happens. Um, so yeah, I mean, against him, I've, I've, I've got sort of, um, you know, my own ideas about how how to play against him. Um, as I do for, for, for all the top players, you know, everyone has sort of everyone has strengths and weaknesses. Um, you know, certain players like potting long balls on the left side of the table. Certain players they absolutely hate potting long balls on the right side of the table. Um, against Stuart Bingham in the semi-finals of the UK Championship, I exploited what I felt was a technical weakness of his, and the, the, pretty much the plan worked perfectly to, to go eight eight two eight three up, and then he, you know, he, he, the pressure was off, and he played unbelievable to get back to eight each, but. You know, the game plan had worked and I'd, I'd done it sort of pretty much perfectly. You know, I've watched his matches and seeing where he misses certain long balls, that, which, which, uh, which cushion he's always hitting the balls into. But on the other side of the table, he had never missed them. So obviously my focus was to leave him tempted on, on a certain side of the table and he kept going for them, missing and leaving me in. Another time I wanted to take you back to, was, um, and I remember it really well, was the meet at World Masters. I remember mean, we had like a combination of events. I think they had the men's doubles, the mi mixed doubles, the singles, they had the junior event. I was playing yeah. in the junior event yeah. there. And uh, I remember you just kind of, you won the main event, you won the mixed doubles, I think. Or I you got, got to beat, the final with Carrie Yeah, she potted a red yellow yeah. in the whole tournament. <laughs> but her safety was really good. <laughs> but um, yeah, I won that tournament. And actually, you mentioned in your book that. Um, I was a bit out of order, I have apologised to you, but I had an accumulator going yeah. oh, and you'd come round sort of from your 
table and you was looking at my table and I come over to you and I say, you know, concentrate on your game because you was my last one in the accumulator and you lost to um, Cliff Wilson. Cliff Wilson, Nine, so I apologise to I you about that on TV. They're all great sportsmen mm. sometimes. They walk in a room, they don't have to be loud, they don't have to be dressed good, they don't have to be... They've just got something about them, you know, mm. and I, I feel it with great golfers, with great players. Mm. Before you even know what they do, you can almost mm. feel some chemistry. I knew Hendry was going to be good, and I did my best to screw him up as much mm. as I could, mm. because I'm fighting my corner for my man. Yeah. And I remember his manager then, Ian Doyle, came on and said, I've got this kid, would Davis come up to Scotland and play him ten consecutive nights? And mm. we're paying good money. Mm. And I knew what he was doing, because he was doing what I did. Mm. He was learning. No, no, try, yeah. So I've got two ways of playing it. Do I say no, turn down the money and not give him the experience? Mm. I went for plan B and I said to Steve, I want you to go out to Scotland, I want you to smash this kid up every night. No quarter, don't think it's an exhibition, I want him slaughtered. <laughs> and he went up, he'd done him 9 0, 9 0, 9 1, 9 2, 9 0. It was a Beating of the mm. most vicious beating, and Steve was like loving it because you know, he's an on top player, he yeah. likes to be the man. Mm. And in those days, it was, and he was only a kid, Hendry. Mm. It could have gone either way, mm. it could have finished him off, mm. it didn't. Mm. Where they had the last life, it made him stronger. Yeah. And he was a great, great player, mm. you know. I mean, was there a point though where you thought, I want to sign Stephen Hendry? Uh, I would have signed him if he'd have been available, but he had a very close relationship with Ian Doyle, and, and that, I understand that his relationship was a bit more father and son. Me and Steve's relationship was a bit more older brother and younger brother, mm. you know, because mm. there's 10 years between us. Mm. Uh, Stephen was dominated by his manager, and, who was very, you know, tough on him, mm. and, and probably rightly so, mm. but it meant there was no way in for mm. someone like me. Whereas when Dennis Taylor beat Steve, the commercial reality of, Dennis, if you come with me, you're going to make a lot more money, mm. that worked. Mm. But Hendry okay, yeah. was protected from that. Did you see signing me as an opportunity to regain yeah, some I sort mean, of dominance in the game? Well, it's, difficult I mean, what was going for it's difficult being interviewed by you because you try and make sure you're telling the truth, but at the same time, I've known you for so long, isn't it? You know, What did I see in you was, and again, well, people know I only tell the truth now because I'm too old to lie. I saw prodigious talent when you was 12 years old. Mm. I saw also other things that weren't so good. I saw a kid that was oh, spoiled rotten by his mum and dad. Everything he wanted was there, you know. And they were, obviously, especially with your dad, I remember him, you know, he's, they put a wall around you as well. They mm. gave you the protection that every father would want to give to his son. Mm. So, But actually ability, you see, you didn't have the thing about coming out of the of a, a really rough society or a really poor society you you had a very good upbringing you was looked after you lived in nice houses you had money in the family mm. but you see talent comes through everything if it's really super talent and you always were going to be i mean people used to talk about you in the billy doors you know everyone wanted to own a bit of you everyone wanted to back you in certain stages yeah. because you just had God-given talent, Ronnie, mm. and, and, you know, as I say, I've said it a thousand times, you don't come across the talent you had very often. Uh, now, whether you've made as much of it as you could have done, I think is another discussion. You think I could have done more, don't oh, you? Oh, yes. Yeah. A lot more. Course, a lot more, mm. a lot more. I mean, I managed you once or twice or whatever, a few a couple of times, and, twice, you yeah. know, you were... Uh, you know, you weren't perfect to manage. You know, you weren't. There were times when you was a problem, but, you know, we love you, so you, put, you, you make up with that. But the frustration was, unfortunately, God willing, you've still got an awful lot left to offer. Mm. But certainly, by now, you could have already been ten times world champion. Why do you think I'm still not managed by you? Like, you've managed Davis from yeah. start to finish. Why do you think I I think can't... you're a bit more... <clears throat> you're a little bit more commercial animal, Ronnie. You know, you've got a brain going in different directions. Yeah. You see, someone like Steve... He'd come into my office every year and I'd say, sit down, I'm going to tell you what you've got. Mm. And he would always say, because his checkbook's in my top right-hand corner. You know, you know, he, he's, he's like royalty, Davis. Never paid a bill in his life. Mm. I always looked after him. I spoiled mm. him as well, you know. Yeah. And he'd say to me every year, do I have to look at... I'm like, I said, you've got to look at your accounts. Do I have to look at my accounts? Yes, you do. Am I all right? Mm. 
mm. said, yeah, you're more than all right. Mm. He went, well, I don't need to know anymore. Mm. He's not interested. Now, mm. you're a different animal. Yeah. You've got eyes outside the box. Mm. You know, you always look at a bit of property, look at a deal, look mm. at a business. Mm. It's, a different, it's a different upbringing and di you're different people. Mm. You know, you, you live different lives. I mean, mm. Davis is was blinkered, snooker, 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 snooker. Yeah. You've always had other things. Yeah. As I said, you're one of those mostly really annoying people that unfortunately, and I say it out of jealousy, yeah. unfortunately, you'd have been good at almost anything in sport you tried to do. Mm. You don't even know how good you are now. You've <laughs> never known how good you are. But, mm. you know, you can, you know, I mean, you're a decent runner. I mean, I remember you were playing tennis and you looked the part. As in, you pick up a golf club, you looked the part. For people with no ability like me, it's really frustrating even to share a set <laughs> with you. But, you know, that's why you're Ronnie O'Sullivan and that's why you're the individual you are. And this black to finish and win the Welsh Open with a 147. Brilliant. Sensational. Ronnie O'Sullivan brings the house down.